Good morning. So the Subcommittee on Capital Markets and Government Sponsored Enterprises will now come to order. And without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the Subcommittee at any time. And without objection, any members of the full committee who are not members of the Subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing, although I'm not sure we'll have that. And with that said, um, I will begin by recognizing myself uh, for two minutes uh, with regard to this uh, committee meeting. And before I do that, actually, um, just to say that we have been notified that there will be votes um, uh, right in the middle of things, as is often the case here. So in reality, what we will probably be doing is um, going, doing our opening statements by the uh, members, a couple members, and then going to opening states, statements from the panel. Um, and I bet that'll be just about when um, votes will interfere with us. So we'll go on, take a break, go on recess, and then come back for the uh, deep and penetrating questions that will enliven the discussion for the next three or four hours. <laughs> well, maybe not. So um, let me just address the, uh, the matter before us as far as the hearing today. During the last couple of years, the subcommittee and the full committee have comprehensively sought to facilitate uh, capital formation by considering some 40 pieces of legislation, many of them bipartisan legislation, actually majority of them, I think, by bipartisan legislation. In doing so, we examined the activities of the SEC's major divisions and offices and conducted oversight of the many self-regulatory organizations that oversee different pieces of capital markets. And today, the subcommittee meets to examine the impact of regulations on short-term financing in the U.S. capital markets. Uh, the federal securities laws, which are the bedrock of our capital markets, were put in place eight decades ago to promote the transparency of security offerings and to mitigate and enforce against fraud in the markets. And he created the SEC to carry out this important mission. As the subcommittee is well aware, the SEC's mission is what? It's threefold to protect investors, maintain fair and orderly and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. Congress and market participants have long understood the SEC's mission as such and have recognized that the security laws were not created and were never intended to be a roadblock to access to capital. If you want to revitalize the economy, Congress needs to promote investment, to reduce red tape, and to do so by making it easier for investors and businesses across the country to access capital and to grow. Now, new rules must be not be duplicative, nor contradictory, nor counterproductive, or inspired by a regular regime designed for wholly different entities. And so, it's clear that Main Street is feeling the impact of the literally hundreds of new rules heaped upon our economy over the last few years. And so, this hearing is yet another opportunity to examine the impact of the Volcker Rule, Basel liquidity, and capital rules, and other financial crisis actions are having on the capital markets, and specifically, what we're looking at here, short-term financing. And so with that, I do thank the, each member of the panel for coming today, and I'll recognize you shortly. But at this point... M uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for two minutes. So ordered. I thank the gentleman for yielding, um, but as he yields, I feel a uh, heavy heart but I also feel pride. I am proud that the chairman of this committee has been my friend and colleague for 14 years, as has the gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Nagabauer. And my heart is heavy in that this will be their last hearing with us and the last hearing that Mr. Garrett will preside over. Uh, both of these fine gentlemen, um, have fought for the cause of freedom and free enterprise and prosperity. They have acted with dignity and principle uh, and courage. They have commanded respect on both sides of the aisle. With their departure, this will be a lesser committee and Congress will be a lesser institution. No one can fill their shoes, or in the um, case of the gentleman from Texas, no one can fill his boots. Uh, but people will at least follow in their footsteps. So I did not wish to have the moment pass uh, without recording for the record um, 
the contribution of the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Nagabauer, and the contribution of the gentleman from New Jersey uh, to this committee. And whatever the future holds uh, for Chairman Nagabauer and Dana, and whatever the future holds for Chairman Garrett and Mary Ellen, uh, know that you go with our respect, you go with our blessing, uh, you will always have permanent friends here, and anything that we achieve in this uh, broader committee, please know it is based upon your work. We stand on your shoulders, uh, and you will never, ever be forgotten among this group of friends. Uh, Godspeed, and thank you, and I yield back. Well, I thank, I, thank, I thank the chairman and uh, a unanimous consent to speak out of order as well then to, at this point. But we will get to the panel. Uh -huh. uh, um, uh, I, I very much appreciate that. And uh, I echo the comments um, that the gentleman makes to our colleague and friend and leader from uh, Texas. Um, uh, came in about the same time, worked together with the chairman. Um, you know, the chairman has been most gracious in that it has done something that uh, I don't know that happens that often, has had multiple um, sort of going away, going away um, uh, events. And, um, and, and so you hear nice things said each time. I'm, I'm hoping that he is, Randy and I are both hoping that he's planning at least three or four more of those going away things. So, <laughs> because I know once I leave, leave DC, I won't hear any of those nice things anymore. And I certainly didn't hear him over the last year and a half of the campaign, so <laughs> this makes up for it, um, sort of. Um, but thank you very much. It, it is, uh, I wasn't going to, I was just going to go right into the meeting, actually, but um, uh, I, th I think, I, I said something the other night at one of the going away events, and I said it in jest towards one member. Um, uh, I said it's been an honor and a privilege to work with some of the most dedicated um, smart, uh, uh, in, intelligent in a different way, uh, committed to trying to do all they can uh, for the people uh, of this country, uh, to lift people up in all walks of life, um, regardless of whether they support them or not, um, in their districts, uh, trying to do it for this generation and for the next generation. Um, we're, we've been on the same page for so many issues. Um, in that regard, and throughout that time, we've had some battles that uh, we won, and that was fun, and we had some battles that we, we lost, and uh, we just marked it up to what we had to do the next time, but we just kept on going forward. And uh, I, I looked at my colleagues and my, and my friends as well, knowing that uh, through it all, as, as Scripture tells us, uh, that you run the race, um, you stay the course, and you keep the faith. And I could not have chosen a better group of people to be with during these last 14 years than the people right here. Uh, and the people didn't show up as well. Um, <laughs> and we're taking down names. Mr. Chairman. Um, so thank you very much. I'll yield to the gentleman um, from speak Texas. Out, speak out of order. Absolutely. Without uh, well, objection. I thank the gentleman from Texas for his kind words, as well as uh, the gentleman from New Jersey. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve with these uh, two great guys and, and the ladies and gentlemen that are on the committee as well. And, you know, we, Scott and I have had some, you know, heard some nice things said about us. And one of the things I keep regretting, though, is that my mother-in-law is not here to hear those. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, Scott's provided great leadership on this uh, subcommittee, and I've enjoyed serving uh, on it with you and, and also the, the other projects that we've worked on. And, uh, uh, and to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I see several there that we've worked together on some issues. And uh, so I uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to hang out with you for a few years. And, and now we'll have time to hang out even more. So, <laughs> so gentlemen yields. And to speak out of. General ladies recognize. Uh, I, I'd like to be associated with uh, the comments of the chairman and Mr. Nagamauer and, and speaking about all the fine things about our chairman. Uh, the chairman and Mary Ellen have been friends of mine on a, on a personal level. Uh, 
It was, uh, he's been a friend uh, and uh, a, an outstanding, uh, dedicated, and effective uh, public servant. We did not always agree, but it was never personal, and it was always an honest, and in some cases, fun debate. And, uh, and I, he is devoted to his constituents and, and to serving this body. Uh, I, I will miss him. Uh, he is a fine representative. It has been a, an honor for me to work with him in every way. And we did some work together. We passed some bills together. And uh, I, I just, uh, I, feel, uh, I feel sad that you're leaving. And, uh, and I, I appreciate uh, your friendship and your support, particularly when my husband passed away. I'll never forget how nice you were to me. <laughs> and uh, in any event, you've been an outstanding chairman, and it's been a, a privilege to work with you. We'll miss you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thanks. 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 Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman over here. The gentleman's recognized. We all are gonna really miss you. Um, and um, as you know, we both came in together 14 years ago, and um, it's been a pleasure working with you. I want you to know that you have made some very sterling contributions to the financial stability of our great country. It's been a pleasure serving with you as a chairman. I've served on this capital markets uh, subcommittee with you for all these years. And I really appreciate the great opportunities we had to co-sponsor some bills together, uh, work on amendments and debates on the floor. And I will tell you, there is not a more acute mind of knowledge to understand the basic fabric and the foundation of, the, of our finance system as you. And uh, I want you to go away knowing that not only the people of New Jersey, but the people of this nation are really grateful for your service. Thank you very much for the, our working together. Thank you, it's been an honor, pleasure. And with that, um, we, can, we can focus, oh, Opening statement. Okay. And with that, I turn to the general lady from New York, um, who I will be looking forward to for now personal invitations to events in New York City after. Um, after you will we're, get we're them. Done. There we go. <laughs> okay. um, general lady from New York is uh, is now recognized. Th thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the title of this hearing is the impact of regulation on short-term financing, and for once we can agree, regulation definitely has had an impact on short-term financing markets, but this was entirely intended. The financial crisis revealed huge problems with many short-term financing markets, some of which completely broke down during the crisis. We discovered that the largest banks had become overly reliant on short-term wholesale financing markets, such as the repo market, which can dry up in a heartbeat and suffered a massive run during the crisis. The point of many post-crisis regulations has been to reduce the bank's re reliance on unstable short-term financing, which has significantly improved the stability of the largest banks. A reduction in short-term financing markets was an intended consequence of financial reform. Now we have an ongoing debate about whether certain post-crisis regulations have had unintended consequences for some short-term financing markets, but that debate is far from settled, and I believe we need to see compelling evidence of harm before we roll back core post-crisis protections. There has also been a lively debate about the SEC's money market fund reforms, which took effect in October. These reforms were intended to make the pricing of money market funds more transparent and to reduce the first mover advantage that can lead to devastating runs. The reforms also provided funds with tools to manage large-scale investor redemptions in an orderly fashion. In anticipation of the reforms taking effect in October, many investors moved their cash out of prime and municipal money market funds and into government money market funds, 
which were less affected by the SEC's reforms. It's true that short-term borrowing costs for corporations and municipalities have increased recently, and some commentators have attributed this entirely to the SEC's rules. Most market participants believe that this increase has been driven primarily by the expectation of a Fed in interest rate hike this December. In fact, the data clearly shows that corporate borrowing rates first started to increase shortly before the Fed raised rates for the first time last year, which is exactly what you'd expect if the increase was driven primarily by the Fed's monetary policy rather than the, Fed, than the SEC's rules. Moreover, while one bill has been introduced that would repeal the requirement in the SEC's rule that certain funds are a floating net asset value, or NAV, my understanding is that most investors who have taken their money out of prime funds have done so because of the mandatory gates and fees, not the floating NAV. Therefore, it's not clear to me that simply repealing the SEC's floating NAV requirement would actually accomplish anything. Once investors get comfortable with the new real rules, I believe at least some of this money will return to prime funds. Much of it will never come back, but again, this was an intended consequence of reform. It would be very strange if the SEC's reforms, which were among the most important post-crisis reforms, produced no change at all in the money market funds. So therefore, I look very much forward to the hearing today and what our witnesses have to say. Thank you very much. I yield back, and I will miss you. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. We now, now go to the witnesses, and hopefully the uh, message from leadership was wrong as far as when they're going on to a break for the votes. So we'll begin. Oh, for um, the witnesses. Um, you will each be recognized for five minutes. Your full testimony will be made part of the record. Uh, there should be a little lights or something in front of you to indicate uh, your time. Red is for five minutes. Yellow it means you have one minute left remaining, and um, red is at the end saying your time is up. Um, so at the be very beginning, Mr. Carfine, welcome, and you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Garrett, Ranking Member Maloney. I'm pleased to be here today. My name is Tony Carfang, and I'm a managing director with Treasury Strategies. We're a division of Novantis. We're a consulting firm specializing in treasury payments and liquidity, and we work with hundreds of corporations, uh, municipalities, healthcare organizations, and financial institutions around the country. The issues we're talking about today are very important to our clients, and you know, there are three, what, what I see the big three regulations that have come out of the financial crisis are Basel III, Dodd-Frank, and money market fund reform. These are bold experiments. And as we all learned in high school chemistry, when you do an experiment, you pour the chemicals in slowly and carefully. What's happened in this case is all the experiments went into the test tube at the same time, and that test tube is Americans' businesses and Americans' consumers. And we're now seeing the reaction, and, the, and in some cases, the uncontrolled reaction of that. For example, in the five years since the post-crisis regulation, regulations have been going into effect, there are 1,500 fewer banks in the United States. That's more than a 20% decrease. You know, uh, America used to create about 150 to 170 new banks per year. That's an 80-year average. Since 2010, only two new banks have been formed in the United States. I think that, that gives you a sense of how crushing the regulations have been. But what I'd like to do today is focus on money market mutual funds and point out first that in 2010, the SEC introduced a set of reforms to improve uh, transparency and liquidity, and th those regulations were very successful in terms of uh, providing safety and soundness to not only money market funds, and, but the entire financial system without impairing the utility of those funds to investors. Unfortunately, in 2014, the SEC again came out with, a, with, with an extended set of regulations that, in, in effect, prohibited what they called non-natural persons from investing in stable net asset value, uh, prime and municipal money market funds. And the result of that 
has been to, uh, for, for investors to exit those funds. And what we've seen is in prime funds, and by the way, prime funds are private sector funds, they invest in the commercial paper or other debt of corporations and financial institutions, providing the day-to-day -day working capital for those organizations. Assets have fallen almost 75%, from 1.4 trillion down to about 380 billion. That's hardly a scaling back. They've been crushed. They've been decimated. And the, and the borrowers who rely on those funds for financing, where they are able to find credit elsewhere, have a much higher cost of that credit. On the municipal funds, here the, 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 the impact is, is particularly profound. We, we've seen a, a, a decrease of 50% 50, 50 from about 260 billion down to 130 billion in assets. These are the funds that finance municipalities, schools, hospitals, uh, and universities. Uh, to give you some examples, the, uh, the state of New York has seen just this year a decrease in funding from $39 billion down to $19 billion. Uh, California healthcare finance from $2 billion down to $1.3. But the total de de decline has been $1.2 trillion. And let me point out, this money has moved from the private sector to the public sector. And uh, to put that in perspective, that's more, the $1.2 trillion is more than the entire TARP program uh, of, of, of several years ago. It's more than the stimulus program, and it's several times more than the amount of cash we expect to get back from overseas uh, if we can get corporations to repatriate. The, these are huge numbers. You know, in, in addition to states losing financing, you know, let, let me just point out, uh, you know, uh, the, the Metropolitan uh, Transit Authority in New York City has seen its financing fall from 2.3 billion down to 800 million. They've lost a billion and a half that municipal money funds used to finance. Uh, Harris County, Texas educational facilities have lost, uh, they've gone from a billion one down to 580 million. You know, th these are very real consequences. HR 4216 is, de is designed to provide a simple fix to allow non-natural persons to again invest in stable value money market funds. Uh, this will restore funding. You know, it's the stable value that's the threshold issue that makes this uh, money funds a cash management tool for corporate treasurers. And without that stable value, uh, you know, the, 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 as a source of financing, we, we lose a couple trillion dollars. This, this is all about preserving money market funds as an effective financing tool. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I thank you, that's interesting. Um, now next, rec um, speaking on behalf of the uh, chamber, U.S. Chamber, Mr. Dees, welcome and you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Garrett, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Tom Dees, today testifying on behalf of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and its co uh, Center for Capital Markets Competitiveness. I'm also the chairman of the National Association of Corporate Treasurers. These organizations are fully supportive of the bipartisan efforts of the chairman, ranking member, and other distinguished members of this subcommittee uh, to protect Main Street companies from regulations that, however well intended, place an undue burden on job creators at the heart of our economy as they work every day to finance their businesses, safeguard their cash and other assets, and hedge risks in their day-to-day -day operations in the most efficient and effective ways possible. When it comes to the needs of Main Street businesses, the members uh, of the House have worked together to get things done. In this 114th Congress, you've led the charge in enacting both the End User Margin Bill and the Centralized Treasury Unit Bill, benefiting directly the end user community. We appreciate your efforts, thank you. We support the overall goals to increase the financial market's transparency, safety, liquidity, and efficiency. However, there are areas where conflicting regulations compel end users to appeal for relief. We're seeing compounded adverse effects from the elaborate web of new regulations imposed and so urge a study of the cumulative effects of how these rules interact to produce a greater impact than an analysis of them taken individually would, would predict. In the area of money market fund, uh, fund reform, in mid-October, new rules affecting these money markets came into force that had the effect not only of taking $1 trillion out of the 
market that has long provided treasurers with a diversification away from bank time deposits for investments of temporary excess cash balances, but which also diminished an important source of funding for treasurers seeking to issue commercial paper to fund their day-to-day -day needs. Conflicting with the importance of diversification, the Treasury's rule for simplifying the tax consequences of investors having to track money market fund investments and share prices to the nearest hundredth of a cent now, along with liquidity fees and redemption gates, we instead have greater concentration, fewer funds as alternative, purchasing less non-financial end-user commercial paper, resulting in higher borrowing costs and greater risks of less liquid funding sources. We believe that the net stable funding ratio, also a rule proposed by banking regulators, must have higher, result in higher short-term funding costs for Main Street companies. For example, it requires banks buying a company's overnight commercial paper to hold reserves against that uh, purchase in the form of significantly higher long-term funding for 85% of the balance. As an example of the need for a cumulative impact study, consider the interaction of money market fund reforms and the NSFR rule. The money fund reforms drive for greater liquidity has driven funds holdings maturing in less than a week, including bank certificates of deposits and commercial paper to increase from 54% at June 30th to 68% at the end of November. However, the very structure of the NSFR is to force banks to issue their funding not at one week or less, but on a far longer term basis with higher costs passed on to their borrowers, Main Street companies. These conflicting regulatory company uh, conflict, these conflicting regulatory uh, forces will tend to increase our costs. The rules were adopted without an economic analysis of their implications and ultimate costs. To summarize, Congress was instrumental in clarifying that non-financial end users should not divert capital from investments in their businesses to unproductive regulatory set-asides such as the daily posting of cash margin for their derivative positions. However, the banking regulators have implemented rules on capital that banks must hold against derivative positions as well as uh, against loans to end users and other advances to them that have the same economic effects. These capital and liquidity rules create real impacts and costs on end users' ability to manage risks and access capital. This is why we support undertaking a cumulative assessment of the impact of these rules on end users. The imposition of unnecessary burdens on end users' businesses restricts job growth, decreases investment, and undermines our ability to meet and beat our foreign com competition, leading to material cumulative impacts on corporate end users and the U.S. economy. Thank you again for your attention to the needs of Main Street companies. Great. Appreciate your testimony. Next up, Mr. Conzel, you're recognized for five minutes, and welcome to the panel. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Garrett, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Michael Konzel. I'm a research fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. Previously, I was a financial engineer at Moody's KMV, a provider of credit analysis tools to lenders and investors. The 2010 Dodd-Frank Act has many important accomplishments, one of which is reducing the regulatory arbitrage that characterizes shadow banking. Here I refer to the financial activity that follows the functions of traditional banking but without explicit banking regulations or access to deposit insurance or emergency lending. This sector is often regulated through securities laws, which emphasizes disclosure over prudential regulation. One of the primary elements of shadow banking is money market funds, whose collapse in the aftermath of the failure of Lehman Brothers was a defining moment of the panic. As a legal matter, money market funds function as mutual funds and are regulated as such. But as an economic matter, money market funds share functions identical to bank deposits. They allow for investments to be liquidated at any time at par with the expectation that they will return the capital amount invested plus interest. This exposes them to runs, a risk that has been covered up previously because of the ability of sponsor funds to provide capital injections. Yet they blur the line between these two regulatory worlds of security and banking law. The history of these funds has always been tied to this regulatory blurring, as former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker recently noted. I was there at the Federal Reserve Board when these funds were born. It was obvious at the time that these products were created to skirt banking regulations, end quote. Since the crisis, the SEC has, imported, uh, has imposed several regulations on money market funds designed to increase their stability and reduce the likelihood of runs. The most important requires the use of a floating net asset value for prime institutional funds. 
As SEC Commissioner Daniel Gallagher noted at the time, quote, this addressed a three-decade-old era in a nuanced and tailored manner to reinstate market-based pricing, end quote. With this change, there's less of an incentive for mass withdrawal under stress conditions. There's no cliff effect of breaking the buck, and it reduces the first mover incentive. There's also an issue of transparency as it gives investors a better understanding of the risks they face. It's worth noting previous efforts to educate investors that these instruments do not function in deposits and could break the bunk have not worked. This was attempted in both 1991 and 1996 by the SEC with language provided in my written testimony. Disclosures are not a sufficient substitute for proper regulation and market-based pricing. Beyond this, Dodd-Frank provides for the graduated, consolidated level liquidity and leverage requirements on the largest financial players. These are essential for risk management. By itself, risk-weighted requirements are pro-cyclical and can subject to unexpected asset-wide downgrades. Leverage requirements provide a backstop and an important complement to other regulatory uh, capital tools. And just as equity is regulated, debt should be regulated too and ensure that the term structure of debt of a firm ensures sufficient liquidity to survive a panic without massive capital lender of last resort backstops. There are concerns that this is affecting the real economy. Yet it is difficult to see actions in the real economy that would indicate this negative effect. According to analysts at the New York Fed, quote, price-based liquidity measures, bid-ask spreads, and price impacts are very low by historical standards, indicating ample liquidity in corporate bond markets, end quote. We do not see this in the survey data either. In surveys conducted just this month by, in monthly by the National Federation of Independent Bureau, uh, Businesses, only 4% of small businesses indicate that their borrowing needs were not satisfied in the past three months. Um, this number is down over the past several years. Instead, uh, the National Federation of Independent Businesses uh, researchers find that, quote, record number of firms remain on the credit sidelines, seeing no good reason to borrow, end quote. This is mirrored in the Federal Reserve Survey of Loan Offices, which indicate declining credit spreads over the past several years. We also do not see this financing constrain corporate governance decision making. Dodd-Frank was reducing the ability of corporations to borrow to invest. We would expect firms to retain more earnings, substituting against other types of capital streams capable of sustaining investment. However, total shareholder returns on the S&P 500 set a 12-month record high in 2016. 2014, spending on buybacks and dividends across the uh, non-financial corporate sector was larger than the combined net income across all publicly traded uh, non-financial US companies for the first time out of a recession. Uh, we do not see, certainly out of macroeconomic effect, the shifts associated with reduced financing for investments. Even with all this work done, experts rightfully remain concerned about destabilizing elements in the shadow banking market. Efforts should go further. There are several avenues um, that could be investigated. Um, more broadly, important reforms remain in establishing a system of minimum haircuts for security financing transitions. And revisiting the bankruptcy codes, carving out of derivatives and other financing contracts can help provide stability and reduce the potential to runs. These risks are real and they still remain. And I think it's important to be vigilant to them as we go forward as the crisis recedes into the background. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Last and not least, uh, from SIFMA to me, recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Garrett, Ranking Member Maloney, and the distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify on behalf of SIFMA and to share our member firm's perspective on the impact of regulation on the capital markets. Before turning to my opening statement, though, I want to make a, uh, take a brief moment on behalf of SIFMA to thank Chairman Garrett for his years of service on this committee and years of leadership of the Capital Markets Subcommittee. We always appreciated your thoughtfulness with which you approached an issue. Thank you. Regarding the topic of today's hearing, let me start by applauding your focus on ensuring that an appropriate balance is struck between regulation and growth. We believe it is time for an evaluation of the intended and unintended consequences of the post-crisis reforms. Much of the regulation has been implement, that has been implemented seeks to address key contributors to the financial crisis and has made both banks and the system safer and sounder. Recently, however, market participants have raised concerns that the reforms have resulted in reductions in market liquidity beyond what was intended particularly for the high-quality liquid assets that underpin the financial system and our economy. We see the resiliency and depth of market liquidity as a critical objective for policymakers to consider. If market participants' ability to access liquidity is impaired, particularly during stress periods, it will negatively impact functioning of financial markets with broad ramifications for the economy. Regulations that are risk insensitive and regulations that target the same risk multiple times through overlapping rules 
may weigh particularly heavily on vital, vital market functions. As such, we believe now is an appropriate time to assess the existing framework. Specifically, we recommend an assessment of coherence and cumulative impacts on a forward-looking basis to identify cases where there may be unnecessary duplication or conflicts between specific regulatory requirements and broader policy goals. A recent effort undertaken by the European Commission provides an example of the type of call for evidence or review that we think is both warranted and timely. The Commission specifically sought feedback on the impact of financial regulation on the ability of the economy to finance itself and growth, unnecessary regulatory burdens, and interactions, inconsistencies, gaps, and unintended consequences. These are exactly the right areas of inquiry. For any review undertaken domestically, we would note a few areas for consideration. First, in looking at the full rule set in place today and what we expect to come online in the near future, we find potential conflicts between the rules that together could have negative impacts. Second, the treatment of low-risk, high-quality assets like cash and cash equivalents varies depending on the rule and often does not reflect their low-risk or risk-free status. Finally, the assessment should examine the calibration of specific rules that are designed to serve as backstops, but that actually operate as binding constraints. Turning to the specific focus of the hearing, I would highlight the importance of the short-term funding markets in the financial system. In particular, repo markets provide the necessary grease that allows the U.S. capital markets to remain the most efficient and liquid in the world. This facilitates lower cost credit to businesses, municipalities, and the federal government. Several significant regulations, some of which are not fully in place yet, have been proposed and are adopted that have a direct impact on the repo market and other short-term funding markets. While some of, these market, some of these impacts are clearly intentional and reflect the policy concern for over-reliance by financial institutions on short-term funding, SIFMA believes that the cumulative impact of these regulations reflect neither the risk to the financial system nor individual firms. Rules, including the supplemental leverage ratio, the liquidity coverage ratio, the net stable funding ratio, may impact short-term funding in different ways, but the overall interaction of these regulations is unclear. Our concern is that these potential, potential conflicts will become evident during stressed environments. In conclusion, the time is right to provide a wholesale review of the impact and coherence of these requirements with a view towards a better balance of safety and soundness on the one hand and efficiency, liquidity, and capital availability on the other. As liquidity diminishes or becomes more brittle in these markets, higher costs of capital may be inevitable for both the government and Main Street. I thank you for your interest in this important topic and look forward to your questions. Great. Thanks. So the um, floor was cold, but we'll have time to do a couple uh, witnesses or a couple of uh, questioning. So I'll start with myself. So it appears that uh, there's some uniformity in uh, most of the testimony as for, as to use your words, Mr. Toomey, some brittleness of the, uh, of the market and uh, tightening of liquidity. So a couple of, couple, well, one aspect of that is this, is that there was a study done, and I forget it was in the testimony or not, with, by Deutsche Bank saying, estimate that dealers have cut down their inventory by uh, some like 80 some odd print, 80 some odd percent, right? You're nodding your head. Which to me, as I think that in, in layman's terms, that's like in manufacturing or retail that you're getting into a just-in-time, you're, you're hoping to have a just-in-time delivery at that point if you're, you're if you're, if what's on the shelf is, is way down. Um, right. And when so Mr. Carvine, in, then what's the reaction to the marketplace to that, as I coined it, just-in-time delivery? Are they able to or deal with that? Well, the just-in-time inventory means bids and ask spreads are wider, which means costs go up for, for, for everyone participating. So what does, that mean? What, what does that mean to the layman that the bids are wider to Main Street as far as my borrowing costs? It means when, when you're borrowing, you pay a slightly higher price. When you're lending, you get a slightly lower yield. Right. And so what does that mean as far as me as a local, small business or medium-sized business as far as my ability to expand or what have you in that marketplace? Well, at the, at the, at the margin, uh, funding becomes more expensive, and at some point you're going to decide not to do the project. Okay. Or hire the employee. And so that was not the intention, obviously, in legislation that Congress passed. In the, and I go, go to Mr. Dees on this as far as you were referring to something. Um, oh, I know. It was on the end users. And the intention of Congress here was not to have the, um, the high requirements 
um, reserves requirements there, right, to, to the specific end users in that category. Um, but you point out what I would sort of, I would coin the phrase uh, an end run, if you will, by the banking regulators saying, well, if Congress is saying we're not going to be able to impose those requirements over here, we're going to do it how? As you were suggesting, over here on the, uh, through the banks, right, through the banking regulators. You want to sp speak on that again for 30 seconds? Yes, sir. The, uh, th this committee was, uh, was very clear in, in uh, directing the banking regulators that they should not require end users to set aside cash to margin their derivative positions. Right. And yet in the regulations they've imposed, they're essentially requiring the banks to do that. And what we focus on as end users is the banks, the, the way we look at them, they're mere intermediaries in the system. Right. In the end, we're the productive economy. They get the money from where it's generated to where it's needed. And if an extra cost is put on them, it's ultimately borne by us, the productive manufacturing companies of this country. So I got it. So you add that to what Mr. Carfine was talking about, this other problem, what Mr. Toomey was talking about as well as far as use the word brittleness to it, and the expansion of the spreads and the cost to the system, right? So what's the result of that? Well, well you're, you're seeing, well, not beside the result, you're, I guess we've heard the result, you're seeing that in the marketplace, right? Yes, sir. And we're seeing um, occasional exacerbations of that through uh, the flash crash and that sort of thing, right? Um, but we don't hear that from the regulators. Um, Treasury Secretary, the Fed Chair reject any notion. They've been here a number of times in the past. We throw these questions out to them and we say, gee, is there a problem here? Is there a liquidity problem here? And they see no evil in that area. Why is it that you're seeing something, and I throw this to the panel, that the regulators can't seem to be seeing? Well, sir, we will see it when it comes to a, a tightened or, or stressed financial markets. When this kind of capital flows out of the market for end users, when a trillion dollars that was in prime money funds, much of which in, in April of 2012, money funds right. bought 40% of commercial paper, non-financial commercial paper. It's now at the end of November down to 5%. So the supply demand has been imbalanced. When in, in these times where markets are steady, we're not seeing so much of an effect. We are seeing the numbers, as I've demonstrated in my testimony. But when we get into uh, a more uh, strained conditions, we will see it right. uh, very much. And so give credit as credit is due, as my dad always says, to the Fed chair, because uh, I mean to the uh, SEC chair, that she recognized this and saw it, but would not attribute actually what the cause was. Um, and I think from most of the panel here, Part of the reason why we can't, why, why they're not attributing and she's not attributing the cause is because of why we haven't done a full study to see exactly what the cumulative effect was of all these regulations. I know we've had all the, 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 the Fed chair and others and the Treasury Secretary here as well, and we've always asked them, what is it really costing the system what you're doing? What is, are you really costing the system of Dodd-Frank and the 400 regulations and to a man or to a woman? they can't give an answer to that, correct? Yes, sir. They, uh, we, we would very much urge that these interactions be studied. The, the regulations have been looked at individually, but they don't see the compound effect. The cumulative effect, yeah. Money market funds uh, are not just a, s a source of, of, of short-term investing opportunity for treasurers, but they buy our commercial paper, they finance our businesses, and when a trillion dollars flows out of them, we pay more to finance day-to-day -day operations. So yeah. these new regulations, though, should be rolled back while that study is going on so that they don't continue to do ongoing damage. Yeah, first, do no harm. With that, I yield now, thank you, gentlemen. I yield now to the general lady of New Thank York. you, thank you, everyone, for your testimony. And I, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Konzal and Mr. Carfang uh, a question, and get both of your perspective on it. And I was, quite frankly, uh, uh, struck by the the decline of uh, money municipal money market funds uh, in New York, the city that that I represent. Um, but my office is telling me they call the city and they don't see this as a big problem. Which I, it's hard for me to understand. If you have a 50 percent decline, that's a pretty serious thing in my mind. So I'd like to to see say that obviously we've seen investors uh, pull out a, a substantial amount of money from the money market funds this year. And, and some claim that this is all due to the floating NAV requirement in the SEC's rule. But the bill only deals with the floating NAV. 
But some of the investors that I've talked to say that the bigger problem is the gates and fees aspect of this SEC rule, which gives funds the ability to suspend withdrawals in times of stress. Many people use their money market fund as a, a, a liquidity <coughs> access point, and they don't like the, the point that they may not be able to pull their money out, so that that's why they're pulling it out. So I'd like to ask both of you, do you think that if we did away with just the floating NAV requirement, that that would cause investors to put all their money back into the money market funds, or are the gates and fees the bigger problem here? Thank you. You, you, you make an excellent point. Gates and fees as well as the floating NAVs are all problems. I've testified that uh, in, to that in the past. The floating NAV is the threshold issue, however, because NAVs started to float beginning October 14th. Corporate treasurers would have needed to change their investment policies, get board approval, uh, implement systems, change their, their, their tax reporting. That was the threshold issue that caused the problem. Gates and fees are clearly a longer run problem. In, in a black swan event, the, you know, the possibility of a gate clearly is a problem. We, we think that if we can change that threshold issue on the, on the FNAV for, for non-natural persons, that can begin the process of at least bank sweep accounts going back into money market funds as well as institutional investors. Uh, longer term, you know, the commission itself, I believe, needs to address the uh, fees and gates issue of that. But we need to get, you know, 40, 4216 sends a signal to the commission that uh, this committee wants to keep money market funds in business We'll reinstitute the floating NAV, and <coughs> the commission itself can deal with the regulatory aspects of fees and gates. Mr. Kunza. Uh, a quick point to answer the previous question. There's still very little evidence of right now of increased bid-ask spreads in the corporate bond market. Um, you know, re research d differs on this, but um, it's important to remember there's a distinction between what's happening right now and what could happen in a crisis. In a crisis, we've already seen $400 billion of institutional prime money market funds flow into, into treasuries, essentially, uh, in a very short period of time, in essentially less than a week. So we know what it looks like already stressed under a fixed NAV market. Um, I do think there's some concerns about removing the floating um, NAV with keeping the gates and fees. I think there's an additional incentive, uh, an increased incentive to run under those conditions. Um, we should distinguish also between an evolving credit market uh, where you know it's going to look a lot more like the stock market, uh, just in time, as people brought up, as the chairman brought up, um, and also we should distinguish between uh, liquidity and treasury markets, which function a lot more like the stock market at this point, uh, with algorithmic training, where you could see some things like a flash crisis, but that is less to do with bid ask spreads and a lot more to do with just algorithms. Would anyone else like to comment on this question? No. Listen, we have a vote, so I'm going to, I have 55 seconds left, but I'm, I'm going to yield back my time and run, make sure I don't miss my vote. Thank you all for your testimony. I'll be back. Generally, the yields back. Um, we do have a minute <laughs> left, um, or, or less than, we have 45 seconds left in our vote. So um, we will call a recess for this committee and uh, reconvene immediately after the floor votes. Committee is in recess.
Meeting is called back into order, and the gentlelady from Missouri is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank everyone for appearing today to discuss the impact the Dodd-Frank regulations as well as actions by FSOC uh, and the Basel Committee have had on short-term financing in the U.S. capital markets. Uh, as Mr. Dees noted in his testimony, and I quote, liquidity is the lifeblood of any business. Um, and that, as I go on, without having ample liquidity, production comes to a halt, inventories run low, and bills are not paid on time. I appreciate those words. Treasury Secretary Liu has continually refused to acknowledge the possibility that regulations such as the vocal, vocal rule, as well as other post-crisis regulations, are contributing to illiquidity in certain segments of the fixed income uh, markets. However, other government officials, including Federal Reserve Board of Governors, uh, have acknowledged that these regulations may, in fact, be a factor. Mr. Dees, do you believe that Dodd-Frank, Basel III, and other regulations are contributing cause of diminished fixed income liquidity? Congresswoman, yes, um, I, I certainly, it certainly is the case that when a trillion dollars has flowed out of a prime money market funds, which went from a position of buying 40% of manufacturing and other non-financial companies' commercial paper in April of 2012, to now at the end of November, only 5% of their commercial paper, and that source has, has dried up. That's been a direct result of, of, of these changes, uh, and it's increased the cost. For instance, the uh, cost of uh, prime money fund, the yield that they uh, are, are paying now is 22 basis points, mm -hmm. higher than equivalent government money market funds for the same uh, maturity for one week uh, maturity. 22 basis points higher. Yes, ma'am. Outrageous. What are the real world consequences bes besides that of, of reduced liquidity in the corporate bond markets for U.S. companies, their employees, and individuals uh, that are saving for retirement to send their kids to college? Well, we've all uh, supported the goal of, of greater price transparency. And when there's no liquidity in the corporate bond market, then when a, 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 an industrial company comes to the market to issue its bonds, it doesn't know, uh, nor do its underwriters know, what's the right price. And in order to assure that they get the issue off successfully and there isn't an embarrassing withdrawal of the issue from the market, they may well overprice it. And so they'll price it to clear the market, and sometimes you get the effect of of selling your house and the real estate agent tells you they've sold it in one day, you may wonder how that was priced. <laughs> and that's what happens in the corporate bond market. And that's a burden that you have to pay for the remaining 10 years or 30 years of the corporate bond issue. Good analogy. Uh, what resources is uh, the SEC or FSOC devoting to uh, understanding or combating uh, this, this problem? Well, we think not enough resources when it comes to analyzing the effect through a cumulative impact study of the interaction of all these forces. In some cases, they've analyzed the individual effects, but there is a cumulative effect and an interaction, as I uh, demonstrated in my comments on how money funds mm -hmm. relate to commercial paper borrowing costs for companies. And they, ha they haven't studied that, and we think it would be important uh, for, for, for this committee and for, for Congress to mandate that these regulators conduct such a study. Thank you, and in my limited time, the EU recently undertook a uh, call for evidence uh, to analyze the cumulative impact of post-crisis financial regulations to identify areas where they have interacted in ways um, harmful to economic growth. In your testimony, you noted several times the need to study the effects of all of these rules and their interactions with one another. Do you think a similar initiative as EU's call for evidence would be valuable here in the U.S. as we transition into a new administration, sir? Yes, I think it, it very much would be uh, as, as well, uh, I mean, it, in, the, um, in the European uh, 
community, they've specifically exempted end users. They've recognized that end users' participation in these markets is for productive purposes, that they're not engaged in speculative activity. And so uh, the burden that would be placed on a trader maintaining an open book for financial speculative purposes should not be placed on end users. And we've been much less consistent in the implementation of that philosophy here. So studying the actual costs would be what we would highly recommend. Absolutely. Thank you for your uh, testimony, for your presence here today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I thank yield you. back, and, and I thank you for my time uh, serving with you on this committee. I thank you. Thank the gentlelady. Mr. Carney. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Scott. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, panel, I was uh, very seriously concerned about the health of the market for money market funds. When, as you know, during the financial crisis, we saw funds breaking the buck. And uh, I think you know what I'm talking about there. It's where m money market funds seek to maintain a stable net asset value, or called NAV, so that each share in the fund is worth $1. But during a catastrophic event like the financial crisis, when shareholders in the fund all redeem very quickly, the fund's NAV can drop below $1 which is why they call it breaking the buck. Now, recently, the F, uh, FSOC took notice of this, and the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission adopted the floating NAV rule, applying it to non-retail investors in tax-exempt funds. The theory was that those funds mostly cater to the retail investor, and the impact would be minimal. But it's my understanding, however, that the impact has been anything but stable. And what we're seeing today is that tax-exempt funds have been very negatively impacted, regardless of whether those funds are serving retail or institutional investors. So I'd like to ask the panel if you, if you all would respond and comment on whether you think that the Securities and Exchange Commission did a sufficient job at understanding the impact of this rule and the impact it might have on the market, or if there are other factors outside of the security exchange rule that may be contributing to rising short-term borrowing costs. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, Mr. Carling. I don't think anyone, including the Securities and Exchange Commission, imagined that $1.2 trillion was going to leave. Uh, I, th I think that exceeds everyone's wildest, uh, worst case scenario. Uh, and in that regard, you know, uh, I think it's important to step back and understand what factors took place. In my testimony, when I talk about rates rising, uh, I'm, I'm looking at spreads. So um, the, the Fed rate hike, for example, last December, uh, impacted the markets. But what, if you look at the spread of LIBOR, which is the basic business borrowing cost over treasuries, that spread has widened. Market rate changes impact both of those identically. Mm -hmm. So we are actually seeing evidence of about a 25 or 30 basis point increase in borrowing costs over and above what the Fed rate changes have done. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would, yes, I, would, I would just like to... Uh, um, like us to remember that the SEC came to this decision slowly and carefully. Uh, did um, you know immediately after the crisis it instituted certain kinds of reserving uh, and liquidity issues to um, deal with the immediate uh, aftermath. But then, in conjunction with FSOC, in conjunction with international regulators, and in conjunction with many studies of the market as a whole, in 2014, only after those many years of study, that it did take this action. We do want to remember that we're in an environment of general increasing interest rates. Um, you know, Goldman Sachs has predicted, you know, large deficits in the near future, uh, and which will obviously lead to a more quicker than normal normalization of Federal Reserve policy. So you, it's very difficult to disjoint what's happened in the past month um, from the broader macroeconomic condition, which has certainly changed. Um, but, you know, SEC came to this decision very slowly and carefully after considering whether its initial actions were sufficient and broad agreement through FSOC that it was not. Well, do, you, do, do any of you feel, as some suggest, that the investors are overreacting in pulling their short-term cash out of uh, money market funds 
that do not offer a stable nav. And they suggest that once investors understand floating nav funds better, they will flock back in. Um, do you agree with this? Congressman, we, uh, the practicalities of this rule change requiring now to keep track of investments in money market funds down to the nearest hundredth of a cent, mm -hmm. and to do so for both federal and state income tax purposes, and to record gains and losses if an investment is made on Tuesday and the company needs to liquidate part of that investment on Thursday to meet its payroll, mm -hmm. then uh, that's a, a record keeping burden that we warned the SEC companies are not prepared to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And within a company, there are, is a competition for resources between departments that are uh, engaged in profit-making activities and those that are engaged in compliance and profit making usually wins. So, the, so what happened was money was pulled mm. from these investments requiring this kind of, uh, uh, of record keeping and it went to the tune of $1.2 trillion. That's right, very good. Thank you very much. Gentlemen's Chairman. time. Mr. Messer. Oh, oh, Chairman, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Tanner. Um, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to have this letter with Ms. Moore and us uh, without, for the record. without objection. You want to take it down to them? Um, I'd like to follow up on those questions. I'm going to start with Mr. Dees. You know, we often talk about it um, here in this committee, but in, in, in life and in public service, we're not just accountable for our intentions. We're also accountable for our results. And that's actually, if you ask the American people, the results that matter a lot more um, than our attention. Sometimes things done with the best of intentions can end up with results that are um, maybe unintended but catastrophic. And following up on the money market reform debate we were just having, um, the floating net asset value rule, I just want to ask you a very direct question again to Mr. Dees. Do you think the economic benefit of the rule is worth the cost? So thank you for that question. I, I think just to reiterate what uh, my colleague Tony Carfang has said, we've measured the cost. So it's upwards of 25 or, or, or so, 20 to 25 or 30 basis points in higher cost. We view from the point of view of manufacturing company treasurers that the financial system is a mere intermediaries getting the money from where it's generated to where we need it. And that's an that's a extra burden that we now have to cut some other costs or decrease employment in order to overcome. I think that's answered no, right? You don't you don't think it's worth the cost. Yes, sir. Right. I agree. Mr. Carving, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, and the, the increased cost is 25 or 30 basis points is against $10 trillion of debt keyed off of the LIBOR rate. So we're talking about an increase of $30 billion of cost. And, you know, companies like FMC, where, where Tom was treasurer, you know, aren't even going to consider that. Uh, and obviously exit. Uh, Mr. Carvey, I wanted to follow up with, with you and, and ask this question. Do, do you believe, you've talked about this imbalance, do you think it's going to get worse in the coming months or better? Well, it, it, it looks like the decline out of prime funds has stabilized. But as one of my colleagues told me, you know, falling off a cliff and hitting a rock and, and calling your fall stabilized uh, is, is not necessarily what, what you want to achieve. I mean, it's not there. laughing matter, but I mean... No, no, it's not, it's not happy. Uh, I, I don't think it can turn around until... Uh, we, we, we get relief on the fluctuating net asset value short term and then fees and gates on in, in, Which can, in, I think, in and I think the follow-up is fairly common sense, but still would ask you to articulate. You, it, could you expand on I mean, what, what is the answer here? What, what do we need to do in response to this trillion dollar drop? Well, you know, I, th I, I, th I think first of all, you know, H.R. 4216 will restore the floating nav for non-natural persons. And th that sends a message to, to the commission uh, that, that, that Congress really wants to protect and defend the money market fund as a primary investment vehicle, uh, as, as it has been for 40 years and several tr tr trillions, of do trillions of dollars. Getting the fluctuating nav fixed for non-natural persons will uh, uh, remove the administrative bar 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 uh, barriers to corporate treasurers investing in, in, in these funds. Will also allow banks who sweep 
into money market funds and, and by definition then must sweep into a constant net asset value fund to pull some of their assets back in, as well as wealth management groups and, and brokers who sweep on behalf of both retail and, 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 and corporate clients. So that begins to open the door for some of the money to come back and then that would allow the commission then to, to uh, go back and alter the, the uh, fees and gates part of this. Thanks, Mr. Steve, you, you look like you might have something to add, no? No, sir. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, with that, I, I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is yield back. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Carney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's, let's just continue this, this conversation, if we may. Um, and I'd like someone, maybe you, Mr. Consul, to remind us uh, why we got to the point of considering a floating NAV and what the, what the issue there was and so we can evaluate um, the action that's been taken and the costs that you uh, question in terms of 20, 25 basis points. Could you, could you remind us of how we got to this point? Absolutely. The uh, cost of the financial crisis, um, for instance, from the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Dallas, is about 10 or $15 trillion. So if money market that's funds... That's a little bit higher than what we've been talking about in terms of the effect of this move, which you would argue is in part just a movement of interest rates on the way up kind of naturally. Absolutely. And if money market funds contributed 3% of that crisis, which I think would be a low estimate, uh, suddenly you're talking about a really big wave of cost-benefit analysis. And what was the issue there with respect to the money markets and how they performed or didn't perform the concerns that were raised vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the breaking the, the buck, if you will? Absolutely. So as economists across the spectrum have agreed that um, the way money market funds were legislated and regulated as fixed NAVs is indistinguishable from bank deposits. So it encourages runs, it encourages uh, first mover advantage to remove those funds. And is, is that actually true? Did that actually happen? Do we have the kind of runs that were, that were theorized? Uh, does the data suggest that? Absolutely. We saw $400 billion leave money market funds uh, to go to treasuries, a safe asset, uh, within, within weeks in the aftermath of the Lehman Brothers failure. The, fail, the failure of Lehman caused the Reserve Fund Bank to break the buck, but it, the contagion was not limited to money market funds with exposure to Lehman. I think that's very important to remember. If it was an issue of just due diligence against the credit risk of one firm, we would have a different conversation. But the panic that spread across the funds as a whole led to a complete contraction, a complete collapse of commercial paper in a way far beyond anything we're talking about at the margins here. Um, you know, there's been an express, uh, expressed interest of Congress to avoid future bailouts, and I believe that floating NAV provides a market-based transparency and a market-based price for what the actual risk of these uh, investments are when, when treasurers and other companies take them on. And what about the, the point, I think a good one, that uh, there ought to be some analysis of the effect of these regulations and how they interact with one, one another? Uh, in decision making, do you, you think that's been done effectively or, or, or does there need to be more done there? I can't comment to the extent that there needs to be a formal review, but I would say that it is by de the capital requirements that we are discussing separately here, leverage ratio, risk weighted assets, uh, LCR liquidity and, and TLEC are designed to work together. They complement each other in very powerful and important ways. Where risk weighting... Do they also um, provide more of a burden, if you will, a regulatory burden? burden. Um, I, I don't know if burden... In combination as opposed to uh, on their own. No, I, I believe together they actually amplify and make each other work better from a systemic risk point of view. For instance, uh, we know risk weighting assets uh, are pro-cyclical. They, you know, they're less binding and less, less important in times of credit booms and credit expansions where leverage requ requirements are not. You know, if you have the safest assets but you're funded overnight, if there's a little bit of a problem, you can suddenly end up in big trouble if you don't have the liquidity needed to survive two months or to survive one month as per the Bear Stearns rule. So, I feel we, wanna, we do want to understand them as overlapping in a good way because they were designed to do that. So what about the argument that, again, sounds uh, compelling to me that there's a significant um, administrative burden, you know, in terms of keeping track of this and that, that, that otherwise those resources uh, could be used for, for something else in a, in a, in a firm. 
And, and you know, they're, they're, they're perhaps as low-hanging fruit with the And IRS. is there a better way to do it, I guess, is ultimately the question. The issue of tax law I can't speak to. I know the IRS has worked with the SEC and they can talk more, but the actual issue of the floating NAV, I think, is the crucial component. And it's what really defines the market-based pricing of these things. And it prevents the runs and dynamics that we saw in the crisis and we absolutely must prevent in future crises. So I don't have much time to, left, but Mr. Dees, do you... You obviously have a different view of, of that. What would you highlight as, as the difference, the important differences? Yes, sir. Just on the last point you made, the Treasury Department, or, or my colleague made, uh, the Treasury Department did come out with rules to simplify the tax record keeping. The effect of those rules is to force a corporate treasurer to invest all the company's money in a single money market fund, which increases concentration and creates much higher systemic so risk. Is there, so you, you think there's a better, there is a better way to accomplish the same thing? Well, a fixed NAV would do that. Well, sure. And it would be offset by greater reporting, visibility, transparency of what the fund's holdings are so that investors can look at that on a daily basis and make their own choices. Some of these were instituted in 2010 reforms, and we think that sunshine is the best medicine. So it, with the chairman's indulgence, so, so assuming a floating nav, right? So is there a better way to do that, or is this the best way to do it in your view? I mean, I understand you'd go back to the fix now, but I'm talking about uh, given a floating nav, are there things that can be done to make it less administratively burdensome? Well, the, uh, the reality is with corporate systems and cash management systems, it takes literally months to modify those systems to keep track down to the nearest hundredth of a cent of investing the company's funds at a floating NAV. And when we're asked, is there an alternative to spending these money for information technology changes, the answer is, well, yes, I can buy a government money market fund. And enough yes answers were, were made so that a trillion dollars left, and that money's not available for productive purposes. It's available to fund government entities being financed through these government money market funds. I tell you, I'm sympathetic to the argument with respect to administrative costs. Uh, you know, the question gets to be, um, you know, what are the trade-offs? You know, and I think it's every it should be everybody's objective to keep your borrowing costs as low as possible, so that you can keep people working, and that's what what's really most important to to me. And I know my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. It'd be nice if we could kind of work together and, and find uh, the best way to do that to address some of the issues and concerns that came out of the, uh, the uh, financial crisis uh, and move forward in a way that's, uh, that's productive for, for job creation uh, and administrative, administratively not as burdensome for, for firms that, that, that create those jobs. Thank so, you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. I yield back. That was a good question. Good questions. Gentleman from Pennsylvania, recognized for maybe, maybe the last word. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for holding this hearing, and I thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to join the committee just for the day and to ask some questions. I also want to thank you for your service and your friendship on the committee, your friendship to us, and you will be sorely missed. Um, I'm glad we're having this hearing because I've become concerned uh, uh, about the significant dislocation that we're seeing as a result of the regulatory changes that went into effect in October. This rule, which forces institutional prime and tax-exempt money market funds to have floating NAVs, has effectively nationalized the money market industry. Uh, $1.2 trillion has left institutional prime and tax-exempt funds, and much of it has migrated to government funds and treasuries. The rule thwarts investor preference and effectively, in my opinion, subsidizes Fannie and Freddie and the federal government. Municipalities, universities, hospitals, and corporations are seeing their borrowing costs go up, and we can trace this directly to the dislocation caused by this rule. That's why I'm a strong supporter of H.R. 4216, which corrects this problem. I understand the concerns that some members of this committee have raised, but in addition to the fact that money market funds are historically very secure in investments, this bill makes clear that taxpayers will not be on the hook to bail out a failing fund. There is an express prohibition on that. Uh, Mr. Carfang, as you know, I asked Treasury Secretary Jack Lew about this issue at a full committee hearing in September. His response surprised me. At that point, nearly a trillion had moved in, in anticipation of the rules implementation. Yet Secretary Lew said that we were, quote, 
not seeing dislocations in the marketplace on a broad basis, close quote. He went on to add that, quote, we're not seeing problems arising in the market where funding needs can't be met, close quote. Um, I'm wondering if you could respond to Secretary Liu's comments. Well, I, I would be concerned if he, if, if, if he did see a dislocation. This change had been telegraphed for two years, and the Treasury itself announced it was watching and stood ready for, uh, for greater debt issuance if the markets needed the Fed to, uh, the, 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 the Treasury to step in. Uh, these dislocations are real. Uh, companies are paying higher interest rates. Municipalities are losing funding from tax-exempt funds and having to turn to other uh, more When he, when he says funding sources. needs can't be met, um, I mean, is that necessarily the, 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 the question? I mean, that's one of the questions, but there's also a cost associated with that. Well, well sure. The, there, are, funding. there are funds available in the market, but, 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 but at a cost. I, I can go to my father-in-law to borrow money, but I certainly wouldn't want to do that. At, at, at his price, uh, you, you know, I'd, I'd rather borrow from you know, uh, you know, corporate treasurers need to borrow from from the most deep and efficient markets, like like the commercial paper market uh, and, and 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 the bank markets. And, and looking at the municipal context, where I think you testified that uh, assets and tax exempt funds and prime funds have fallen. Well, well, well let's look at tax exempt, uh, um, fallen roughly by half. Right. Uh, uh, this is funding used by municipalities, schools, hospitals. Um, it stands to reason that this rule is to blame for driving some of the money out of these assets, yes? That's correct. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the, the fluctuating NAV and the non-natural person restriction almost makes it impossible for a bank trust department to, to now invest in a tax-exempt fund because the bank trust department has no way of seeing down through into the natural person, non-natural person question. But a natural person still gets to invest in a fixed. Uh, a, a natural person would still be able to invest in a fixed. Well, except a, a, a natural person and a non-natural person is, is, is kind of a fiction. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it, it gets down to the question of who's making the investment decision uh, deep down in, in, inside of an omnibus account. and. The, the, the banks simply have no way of knowing that. If I can yeah, quickly so. go to Mr. Dees, in your testimony you, you wrote uh, uh, that the SEC's rules raises heightened concerns about money market funds, liquidity, stability, and overall utility. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the systemic risks that you see as a result yeah. of the rule? Yes, sir. Um, we've focused on the amount of money that's, that's, that's left, and, and we pointed out to the SEC several times that when you change the rules affecting this investment vehicle known as money market funds, remember that it also has been a significant source of financing for Main Street companies. And we've seen the amount of non-financial commercial paper that money funds buy decline from 40 million 40% in April of 2012 to just 5% at the end of last month. And that supply-demand imbalance has resulted in higher costs for Main Street companies. And when we get into a time of heightened financial crisis, then it will dry up because money funds uh, not only have their, their amounts gone down, but the actual number of funds has declined from 600 funds to 400 funds. So it's not going to be there, and it'll become more evident when we get into strained conditions. Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired. If I could offer to the record a, a letter from state financial officers dated December 1 to Speaker Ryan and from the Coalition for Investor Choice to you and the ranking member. Without objection, it's so ordered. And your last word apparently sparked other interest. And so now we turn to the gentleman from California. And Ed is recognized for five. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I thank the witnesses, the panel, for being with us today. Uh, so we are home to capital markets that are unmatched in terms of the size of our markets, the transparency in it, uh, the depth, the resiliency, as we've seen. And they provide really the fuel that, that keep the largest economy in the world moving and allow for investment and development and ultimately allow for job growth because at the end of the day, 
wages per worker are dependent upon productivity per worker. That's dependent upon investment per worker. And that's dependent upon the capital markets and getting everybody into the capital markets. So it's interesting. The European Commission recently engaged in what they called a call for evidence. And that was a request that the pu to the public for feedback on interactions, inconsistencies, and gaps, and unintended consequences created by Europe's regulatory framework, created by their bureaucracy. And I was going to ask, should, uh, and maybe of Mr. Toomey, should U.S. regulators engage in a similar project as the EU's call for evidence and maybe ask what the benefits would be of such, a, a, such an undertaking? Yeah, thank you. And I, I think as we mentioned in our opening remarks, the European Commission effort and the call for evidence it provides a framework for doing this cumulative analysis on the effects of all these different and overlapping regulations. And we think particularly the parameters that the European Commission outlined, um, the impact on economic growth we think is key. Obviously the interactions and the inconsistencies is key to understand. And I think the ultimate output from a domestic standpoint is understanding how all these disparate um, rules attacking and addressing different types of risks whether they're overshooting their policy goals to the detriment ultimately of the economy. So I think basically when we look at the European Commission effort, um, the parameters they outline are very similar to what we believe should be done and now's a good time to do it given that the rules have been in place for some time, or at least some of them have. Well, I would, I'd also ask Mr. Dees um, on, the, on the testimony that you submitted focused on the impact of bank capital and liquidity rules on end users and on corporate treasurers. Um, this argument, uh, less liquidity can mean production comes to a halt. Less liquidity means uh, often that the inventories run low, that the payroll isn't made on time. All of which, of course, harm the people that rely upon these businesses and harm the, the economy. And um, I would just ask what could we do in Congress here to address exactly these concerns? Congressman, thank you very much for that question. I, I would say that for you to uh, mandate that the uh, banking regulators undertake an analysis of both the individual effects, but equally as important, the cumulative effects based on their interactions of these different rules as they affect Main Street companies. Uh, we uh, made the point and got bipartisan con uh, agreement that, for instance, requiring end users to margin their derivative positions with cash, which was a direct dollar-for-dollar -dollar diversion from funds that would otherwise be invested to grow inventory, to conduct research and development, to buy new plant and equipment, and otherwise to uh, sustain and, we hope, grow jobs, was something that should be done. And uh, in this Congress, uh, that wa was done, but the banking regulators have taken steps that put that capital burden instead on the banks, I think without fully appreciating that in the end, they are intermediaries and we bear, we the end users and the manufacturing companies of this country bear those costs. You know, our uh, chairman of this committee uh, has a firm grasp on history as well as economics. Uh, and I would just, uh, Mr. Chairman, quote Aristotle on this, a balance in all things that are unbalanced. And my fear here is that we've tipped the scales uh, too much towards bureaucracy. Uh, collective action really is needed at this point because at the end of the day, bureaucracy can't, can't take all risk and regulate it out of the market. And the, the facts are that we've got to keep our eye on the main function of the market and drive that job growth. But with that, I'll yield, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your good leadership of this subcommittee. And I thank the gentleman from California. Moving up north to, uh, oh, gentleman from California has arrived. Uh, I would prefer that you go to another member first. Then we shall. Gentleman from Maine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, 
Those of us that, uh, or those of you who are here today, uh, probably don't know that <clears throat> with the chairman's uh, moving on, he'll be spending more time in the great state of Maine that I represent. And I'd like to make it public that, uh, Mr. Chairman, you'd be so welcomed up in Maine with your family. You have no idea. Just bring as much money as you can. We need the business. And, and February is a wonderful time to go to Maine, Mr. Chairman. I, I know you know that. <clears throat> um, with that, um, you know, I'm scratching my, my head here a little bit, folks. Uh, here we have a product, a money market fund product that's been around for decades. And it's been used very effectively uh, by not only individual investors, but by institutional investors uh, to manage their cash, uh, to make sure that there is a way to finance expansion. And of course, when businesses grow, they hire more people and they pay them more money. Uh, I was a state treasurer for uh, a couple years up in Maine, and we used uh, money market funds effectively, different types of funds, to manage our cash uh, such that we could build a new sewage treatment plant in Auburn or or a new uh, bridge uh, over the uh, Penobscot River in, uh, in Bangor, for example. So there are all kinds of opportunities to use this product. Now, all of a sudden, you know, government comes along, and we have a, a, new, a new regulation, and we see money flying from this, uh, this product that's worked for decades well. We see uh, players leaving the space. We see costs going up. Uh, and there's less liquidity in the market and less opportunity to grow our economy and do what we want and have more opportunity, more jobs for our kids. So my, my question is, uh, Mr. Toomey, to you, please. My first question is one of the concerns the SEC has and others have in this, uh, that have been dealing with this issue is a, a run in the bank, uh, accelerated redemptions. And do you have any evidence, or do the folks that you work with have any evidence that this new rule dealing with mark to market or floating nav or whatever you want to call it uh, um, would have an impact uh, in slowing down or stopping accelerated redemptions at a tough time? I'm actually not the best person in my shop to um, answer that question, but we can get back to you on that one. Is there anybody else, on, thank you, anybody else in the panel like to take a shot at that? Well, it's Mr. my Carfain, you look like you're ready to say something. Well, sh sure. Um, it, 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 it will not stop a run, and, and, and in fact, if you go back and look at what happened during the financial crisis, while the reserve fund broke a buck and investors fled, i.e. a run, uh, that, that was on the Monday morning that Lehman went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. The run didn't spread in, in, until it hit the entire capital market on the Wednesday, which was after the Federal Reserve announced a bailout of AIG. It wasn't the reserve fund that spread to other prime funds. It was when the entire market collapsed. So, so what I'm hearing you say, sir, is that market conditions, whether it be economic or capital market conditions, really determine investor behavior. Exactly. Okay. Um, I would like to also respond to that, uh, Congressman. Yeah, please. Uh, to the historical uh, stability of, of the money market fund, it's worth noting that there's been over 200 capital injections by sponsor funds going back to the early 80s. These sponsor uh, capital injections uh, are basically the only way to handle a lot of the failures of these and of these funds, and crucially, they're, uh, they're ad hoc and they're opaque to investors, so they're not even sure when they happen. Um, you know, they can't be anticipated in the way that it happens. Um, and so, you know, if you want to talk about reducing bureaucracy of, of these kinds of things, market pricing strikes me as the best way to ensure that these funds are properly matched to uh, investors' expectations and to also decrease the possibility of a bailout. Mr. Conzo, let's, let's stick with you, if you don't mind, ask out my, my final question in the time that I have remaining here. Um, we have a change in administration um, that is uh, underway now. It will be effective as of noontime on January 20. Um, presumably there will be uh, a couple new uh, chair, uh, uh, commissioners on the SEC and, and uh, uh, Chair White is moving on at the end of the current administration. Um, doesn't it make sense to you that we let the new SEC commissioners deal with this issue? Well, the SEC uh, has already dealt with this issue in 2014 through a very long process of international coordination, coordination with FSOC and other regulators. There's an important reason they put this in. They um, were initially reluctant to do it, and they had to think about it and do a significant amount of an analysis to do it. So it was not entered into lightly, and it was not entered into carelessly. I feel 
uh, it really does reflect something that went wrong in the crisis that is widely acknowledged to have gone wrong in the crisis. And if this is not the appropriate regulation, going back to the regulatory environment of 2007 strikes me as a step backwards, not a step forward. Mr. Dees, would you like to comment on that with respect to the new administration coming in and how they'll be populating the SEC? Yes, sir, I think it, it, it should be undertaken along the lines of this cumulative impact study that I mentioned. And, and we've always said that uh, sunshine is the best medicine. Uh, prior to the financial crisis, money market funds did not report their underlying holdings except on a very infrequent basis. I think it was every 60 days, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, or with a, 60, with a delay. And one of the uh, improvements that the SEC has made is more frequent reporting of even daily positions. And, and we think this provides market participants enough information that they can make their own decisions when to trade out of a fund that's becoming more risky based on their analysis of that underlying data. Thank you all very much. Mr. Chairman, again, I salute you, congratulate you, and I thank you for your service to the great state of New Jersey and to our country. Thank you, sir. And I'll see you in fe February. The, uh, <laughs> Gentleman from California. Well, actually, I may be in California in February. That sounds like a better place to be. <laughs> that, 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 that was my point. If the gentleman from Maine is going to convince you that that's the place you want to be in February, you're more gullible than I previously <laughs> thought. No. Yeah. Gentleman yeah. is recognized. Um, shadow banking is an interesting phrase. Can't imagine anybody being in favor of shadow banking. Um, we want transparency and light. Shadow banking sounds dangerous. Is this term uh, accurate? Where does it derive from? And is there a, uh, a less pejorative term that would be more accurate? Uh, I'll ask uh, the gentleman from the Roosevelt in Institute. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of the history. It comes out of analysis of the crisis by PIMCO, another uh, particularly on the bond side. Uh, the economist Gary Gorton um, wrote several books about it in 20, 2009, 2010. Well, if I was going to sell a book, I would want something hard hitting like shadow banking or the monsters of shadow banking. Uh, you know, that's like, like vampires so many, of shadow banking. But uh, is, is this an accurate. Uh, like so many things in finance, that it's tough to find a, a catchy term for it, but it is absolutely accurate. It refers to banking activities that occur outside the formal prudential banking activity. Uh, credit lending through things that have uh, redemption at par. Um, and as such, you know, it evolves out of the capital markets historically, but basically securities industries. So and you're, you're saying it's, it's limited to those circumstances where you're not going to a regulated depository institution, but you expect to redeem at par. Exactly, and I, want, I don't want to say there's no regulations because, you know, for instance, the it's SEC. not a regulated depository institution. No. Absolutely, and it does not have um, context for deposit insurance or other kinds of insurance uh, prevent runs, and it doesn't have lender of last resort access. Um, those aren't necessarily the right tools to deal with things like shadow banking, but it gives you a sense of how it, it is emerged in a way that creates systemic risk, creates uh, panics and contagion, but doesn't have the tools uh, around it to, to uh, help prevent the systemic risk. Now, uh, investors want to redeem at par, but in fact, they are the owners of shares in a, in a, in a, a mutual fund where assets may be worth slightly more, might, might be slightly less. Now, one way to deal with this is to simply disguise this and tell people that their shares are always worth a dollar when, in fact, they're worth a, a, a mill more or a mill less. Another way to, for the private market to deal with this is some sort of insurance where a private sector entity, instead of disguising the fact that your investment may be worth less than par, would come in and guarantee that your investment would be less than par, uh, would be worth full par, uh, in return for a premium that might take away from investors some of the upside when their investment is worth more than par. Uh, why do we need to tell investors it's worth par when it isn't, instead of allow, having a private sector uh, insurance so that it really is worth par? Um, I'll go now. Uh, I don't know which of you would like to respond. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Carfine. Sure. Daily liquidity is the fundamental uh, mm -hmm. cash management need of corporations, and money market mutual funds have provided that 
uh, since, since their institution over, over 40 years ago. And well, I, I've got and, daily liquidity on my S&P 500 fund, too, but uh, um, it may not be minute uh, uh, liquidity, but it's uh, daily liquidity. But no, nobody's going to tell me that it's worth par. Right. Thank but, you. But, but what, what you have are ultra-short investments in the funds that, uh, that, that can be am amortized to, to, to maturity and actually provide that daily liquidity at par. Uh, and, you know, this is the same way that Treasury and government funds operate. So, you know, this whole argument about separating out the private, the funds that deal with the private sector and municipalities from government funds, well, government funds uh, operate under the same accounting rules as, as, as well. So it seems to me that, 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 that that's a red herring. And, uh, uh, I, that may be red herring, yeah. but it's not relevant to the, to the question I asked. Why uh, have uh, mutual funds that cater to investors who want to make sure they get absolute par to the lax mill, not, why, why have they not simply acquired insurance uh, so that their, uh, their assets are nevertheless wor uh, worth less than par, Mr. Conza? Uh, uh, oh, oh, Diaz then. Yes, sir. Well, I think in the declared policy of zero interest rates, which we've lifted off from uh, very gradually, uh, the cost of the insurance compared to the margin that's uh, available after all the other expenses to, to pay for that insurance is, is just not going to be there. And so the well, cure, well, you do also have the, the upside. The, I but mean, the, the cure the, the, will it's just as likely to be worth a mil more than a mil less but uh, the, than par. The cure will kill the patient, and the patient is already a trillion dollars in worse shape than when this effort started. However well-intentioned, and I agree that it would have the beneficial effect that you say, the patient, but I'm questioning the cost versus that benefit. So, I think that so our way to assure people of par is to just tell them it's worth par whether it is or not. No, sir, what I've testified to is that to provide them with greater information, with daily information, and, uh, and that sunshine is the best medicine, and corporate treasurers are paid every day to protect yep. the company's funds and will look at that information and make a wise decision on behalf of their shareholders. I believe my time has expired. Time has expired. Mr. Holkin is recognized for perhaps the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, I just want to thank you so much for your service, uh, Chairman Garrett. Uh, you have been such a help to me and to so many others. I uh, just want to let you know that uh, uh, I appreciate you, appreciate your family so much, and uh, wish you all the best. And I'm, again, just very grateful for uh, your friendship and your mentoring uh, to folks like me. So thank you so much, and uh, again, all the best to you. Thank you uh, to our witnesses. Grateful that you're here. Uh, Mr. Carfang, I want to address my uh, at least initial questions to you, if I may. On page 7 of your testimony, uh, you stated, tax-exempt funds, a key source of funding for municipalities, universities, and hospitals, have experienced a 51% or $132 billion decline from $260 billion to $128 billion. How much of this decline is directly attributable to the SEC's new rules? Do you think there could be other factors in that? Uh, and then continuing on my question, some of my constituents have raised concerns that the imposition of a floating NAV is increasing the cost for tax-exempt financing. However, I have also heard that the liquidity fees and redemption gates are a bigger issue. Uh, what has your research shown on that? And then last, uh, during a November hearing before the Financial Services Committee, SEC uh, Chair Mary Jo White noted that uh, the recent movements in the mo money market fund occurred consistent uh, with their economic analysis. Chair White also testified that she expects that the institutional prime funds will stabilize and see a return of funds sometime after the October effective date. Do you agree with this assessment? There's a lot of questions. Wow. I apologize. Well, that, that, that was a lot of questions. Well, the first one is, uh, what, what percent of the uh, de decline in tax exempt funds was due to the SEC regulations? All of it. That there's no question about it. Banks had to, uh, for technical reasons, pull out of it uh, b because they simply couldn't sweep and they couldn't identify non-natural non persons. Uh, see, the second part of your question. Well, it was uh, about um, uh, some constituents raised concern about imposition of a floating NAV is increasing costs for tax exempt financing. Uh, but uh, also, I've heard that liquidity fees and redemption gates are a bigger issue. Uh, what is, is your research shown on that? Well, what we've testified, and we've spoken to the Commission as well, that both the floating NAV and, and the fees and gates are key issues. 
uh, and and that the, 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 the should not have been imposed uh, the, the, the way they have been. Uh, the, the floating nav is the threshold issue, though, because there are a number of mechanical and uh, uh, administrative reasons why a number of organizations have to move their money out. So, you know, with, with uh, 4216, that, that actually informs the SEC that it's the intention of Congress to protect and defend and restore money market funds. That can be an immediate fix. And then the fees and gates, which are an issue, can be dealt with longer term. Let me ask you quickly here. Uh, do you believe the SEC and other members of, the, of FSOC should uh, conduct an analysis and see what systematic, uh, systematic, uh, or, sorry, systemic risk uh, could be posed by the decrease of liquidity in our bond market? To your knowledge, has the FSOC or any uh, member agency conducted any analysis of the systemic risk that could result from a lack of liquidity in the corporate bond market due to misguided regulatory initiatives like the Volcker Rule or Basel III? Well, I I, I think the rules, well, they, they, they dry up liquidity in the market, they depress trading, they reduce dealer inventories, so, so, so as a result, there's less price discovery and there's less economic efficiency all the, all the way around. Yeah. And, you, you know, a, a theme I'm hearing is that, you know, the, the, the investors in these, in these prime funds don't understand the valuation uh, or, uh, or, or what's going on in, in the daily liquidity, frankly, that's an insult to corporate treasures all over America. The, the, these are sophisticated folks who know exactly what's in these funds and, and, and understand the risk and, uh, and, 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 and make their judgments based on that. Thank you. Quickly, my last minute, Mr. Toomey, uh, you note in your testimony that uh, repo transactions play a vital role within the financial system and underpin the functioning of the capital markets. You further describe uh, the repo market as the grease that allows the U.S. capital markets to remain the most efficient and liquid in the world so that businesses, municipalities, and the federal government can ac uh, access needed credit at a lower cost over time. There seems to be a great deal of misunderstanding about the repo market uh, by prudential regulators and others. I wondered if you could explain quickly uh, further the importance of the repo market. Yeah, thank you. And quickly on the repo market, it, it indeed it manages to move securities and cash around the system um, quickly and safely. In particular, take the example of a, um, uh, a market maker. It allows a market maker to both source securities to um, service its clients as well as um, provide a venue for short-term cash that may need to be uh, invested on a short-term basis. So all of that provides um, grease lubricant for the overall financial system, uh, allows liquidity to thrive in the cash markets because cash market participants can always source securities in the repo market. Um, so I think that important piece is sometimes missed and it, it really does underlie all our cash markets. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Chairman, again, thank you so much. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and with that, seeing no men, no other speakers, I guess I will just um, conclude with two things on the technical side. Um, I thank all the witnesses for uh, coming here today and for your testimony. I note that members will have um, five additional days to uh, um, enter additional extraneous material into the record, and members also have five additional days to uh, submit additional questions to the witnesses, which we then ask for the witnesses to provide in a timely manner back to the committee. Um, and on a personal note, I guess this is the, my, last, my last hearing, my last speaking, and what have you, so I'll, and, and it's apropos that I come in on a hearing where the hearing topic is the impact of regulations. Um, on the economy, which I guess is why I came to, one of the reasons why I came to Washington in the first place, to figure out why we are doing so many regulations in Washington and the negative effect that it has on, the, on people back at home. So it has been an honor to be able to be here in this uh, House of Representatives and to be in this committee and to be actually a chairman of a subcommittee that is so interesting and so significant to this country. It's been an honor to know all the uh, folks who are on this committee, um, to both now and that have left the committee over the years, that, that we should remember them as well. It's been an honor to have all the folks behind me and next to me, um, my committee uh, chair, um, Designee, but a member of our committee, Brian and uh, Kevin, and, and all the rest here who have been working with us, assigned to uh, the committee over the years, have been really, uh, I'll say uh, the appropriate word, it's been neat working with all of you, and, and it's really fun on these sometimes very 
um, what some people might say boring issues, but I think the members of this committee find them fascinating and uh, extremely important and profoundly uh, significant to this country. So uh, uh, I guess I'll just say, wish you all well, as people say to me, as they don't know what I'm doing in the future. I don't know what you guys are all going to be doing in the future either. Uh, so I wish you well in what is going to be an exciting time for this country where I see in the opinion and public opinion polls there's a huge wave of optimism going forward. So I am optimistic for all of you folks as well, both here behind me, next to me, and in front of me, the, uh, the people who come and testify before this committee as well. Optimistic for the future, what we can do for, what you all can do for the country. And I'm also pleased, and she didn't want me to introduce her or anything else, but my wife, Mary Ellen, is, could be with me on this last day as well. Thank you, the uh, committee is adjourned. Thank you and God bless.